Well, it's time that we kind of took over the medical system here. Uh, many of you will remember Bernie Madoff. Uh, he's been put in jail for life for defrauding his investors of $3 billion, like crazy. Well, according to the Institute of Medicine, which is a ethics group that kind of monitors the goings-on inside the medical profession in America, in September of 2012, they came out and said, 30 cents out of every dollar that you spend out of your pocket and the pocket of your insurance company, not the government, not the government, this is you and your insurance company, 30 cents out of every dollar you spend for doctors' services is fraudulently billed. Okay, we're talking about doctors who do things that you really didn't need, and they bill the insurance company or bill you. Another way they do that is that they bill you and bill the insurance companies for things they didn't even do because they have your numbers. That amounts to $750 billion a year. $750 billion a year. That's three-quarters of a trillion dollars. That's one-third of the Americans' total budget for health care each year is fraudulently billed by medical doctors. They get a walk. Nobody gets their license suspended for three seconds. Um, they certainly didn't have the same punishment that, that Bernie Madoff had. So we have to watch that. Now, we know that doctors kill, injure, and infect 15 million of their customers every year in the workplace. Medical doctors each year kill more people, infect more people, and injure more people than the mafia does in a 1,000 years. Medical doctors infect 2 million in hospitals each year, which 90,000 die. They kill 15,000 seniors each month for 180,000. Okay, they kill, injure, and infect 15,000 every month. That's 180,000 per year seniors over the age of 65 who go into hospitals for minor medical procedures and screening tests. Now, they get a walk. Nobody gets their license suspended. Nobody gets a parking ticket to the equivalent of a fine. Nothing happens. That's because they're, they're um, a protective monopoly. They're self-policing. And there's nobody who has an oversight that goes and looks at their records every month and makes a determination, whatever. So here's what we propose from Young Jimmy. We want drug testing on doctors, nurses, and PAs, and any medical technicians, any ancillary help like physical therapists and so forth. Anybody who's going to have hands-on are the pharmacists in the hospitals and, and pharmacies uh, all over the place. These people need to be drug tested every day. I'm going to talk about blood tests. That would be a little invasive. But they can do a urine test. I mean, they do that for athletes. They do that for bus drivers, over-the-road truckers. And, of course, doctors kill a lot more people than over-the-road truckers Truckers are supposed to be there. But the number one cause of death in America is medical doctors. Hello. Well, uh, this is something we must do. And to do this, we're going to have to put pressure on them. I want everybody out there in earshot of dead doctors don't lie. I want you to contact your U.S. and state representatives. I want you to contact your U.S. and state senators. I want you to contact the President of the United States, the U.S. Attorney General, your governor, and the state attorney general and demand drug testing for doctors. We want urine tests, okay, uh, every time they come into work. That includes doctors, pharmacists, PAs, nurses, uh, nursing home personnel. Anybody who's taking care of a human being needs to be tested for drugs, urine tests. Certainly surgeons, nurses who are in charge of uh, care, um, surgical nurses, pharmacists who are fulfilling prescriptions. I mean, think about it. Each year in America, each year in America, this is a national annual story, 1.5 million Americans are killed or permanently injured. 1.5 million Americans are killed or permanently injured just from prescription errors. Now, we're not talking about the side effects of the drug. We're talking about prescription errors where the doctor gets a decimal point and the dose is wrong, or he may prescribe two drugs at the same time because two cuties in hot pants took him out to lunch and got him to write prescriptions for these things, or even sent call girls to him. That's happening now. Oh, no, 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 we don't give him any kickbacks. We send him an escort to take him out to a long lunch every day. Mm, well, there you go. And so <clears throat> those sorts of things will certainly influence the doctor's purchasing things. And, of course, that's what gets him addicted to drugs, uh, street drugs, prescription drugs, and alcohol. So drug testing now is beyond a suggestion. It is, it, we demand it. It's mandatory. For the public safety, we must get drug testing for doctors, nurses, PAs, um, and also pharmacists. That way we can be more assured. I mean, there's no perfect system, but we're going to be more assured that we don't have right now. 
We've got hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands of doctors each year in America. And, of course, I talked about this before. Lucien LePay, the head of the department of the public health department at Harvard Medical School about 12 years ago, came out and said 52% of the licensed medical doctors are intoxicated each day when they come to work on either alcohol, street drugs, or prescription drugs. Medical doctors kill more people with drugs than all the street drugs guys in America put together for 100 years. They do it each year. And so there's something wrong with this picture. Well, that's because we bet on the wrong horse. We put our trust in them. People regarded doctors as heroes, and they misused our trust. They took advantage of American trust. It's time to take it back from them. Get a hold of that trilogy of books, Let's Play Doctor, Let's Play Herbal Doctor, and the Passport to Aromatherapy, and learn how to do your own lab testing, learn how to do your own physicals, learn how to uh, do these things yourself, and avoid being killed, injured, and infected. Okay, then I want you to get the new book, Immortalium, the new book, Epigenetics, the new book, Epigenetics, and I want you to read the subtitle, The Death of the Genetic Theory of Disease Transmission. The halls of science are filled with thousands of dead medical theories. The most recent one is the genetics cause everything. They cause nothing. Okay? Contact your young Jew associate today and ask for the book, Epigenetics. The subtitle is The Death of the Genetic Theory of Disease Transmission. Save yourself. Flee your doctor. We'll be back with dead doctors. Don't lie for these messages. Okay, Doug, what pearls of wisdom do you have for us? Well, I thought we'd talk a bit about cancer, as I've got a Fox News story that's headlined, cancer anti uh, Can Anti-Inflammatory Foods Help Reduce the Risk of Cancer? See, chronic inflammation may be the cause of many serious illnesses from heart disease to cancer. According to the National Health Institute of Health, they say there's a direct connection between long-term inflammation and the development of dysplasia, or abnormal cell growth, which leads to cancer. See, many factors can contribute, including stress, toxins, genetic predisposition, lack of exercise, and diet. I think you would probably disagree with the genetic predisposition. Mm -hmm. They go on to say many people choose to use uh, daily anti-inflammatory medicines or these NSAIDs or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen say to re reduce their chances of chronic long-term inflammation. According to the Mayo Clinic, research is being conducted into the use of NSAIDs in preventing cancer. However, they say some re uh, research indicates NSAIDs may be causing more harm than good. And I think it's time for one of these. Because you've talked about, you know, how nasty those drugs are. I mean, they cause you to bleed out, have all kinds of problems, are hard on your liver. And they say as a byproduct of this inflammatory pro problems, they say your body creates a lot of C-reactive protein in the body. The research indicates certain foods, including those rich in dietary magnesium, can help combat this reaction. And they say an 05 study found that people who had consumed low levels of magnesium are prone to elevated levels of C-reactive uh, pro reactive protein. So Americans consume magnesium levels well below what is recommended. They go on to say uh, that uh, magnesium is important for many bodily functions. They say uh, you can have the typical symptoms of a, a deficiency, which include weakness, muscle cramps, nausea, anxiety, poor memory, fatigue, dizziness, among others. And they say it's impossible to overdose on magnesium through supplementation. And they go on to list a bunch of foods that are high in magnesium, like oysters and blackstrap molasses and black beans and spinach and cashews, pumpkin seeds, and so on. Also uh, say that uh, omega-3 fatty acids play a major role in reducing inflammation and the risk of chronic disease, including cancer, which is also something I've heard you say before. So you got a two for today, Doc. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Doug. But certainly, that's quite correct. And that's one of the big things about the um, new product, Immortalium, uh, to extend the life of telomeres beyond the hay flick limit of 51 duplications. We're going for 100 duplications. We're going to call it the Wallach limit. And um, we do this with bioflavonoids and antioxidants, everything running from selenium to um, high auric point uh, things, uh, beta carotene, vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin E, and uh, just bioflavonoids uh, in themselves. These are things you get from uh, dark uh, berries, things like Z radical, uh, cell shield RTQ, R for resveratrol, two capsules of the um, cell shield RTQ, Gives you the amount of resveratrol you get in 246 glasses of red wine. I'd take six of those a day. 
So I'm getting the equivalent of 900 glasses of red wine worth of resveratrol without the alcohol. Also quercetin, uh, that's the Q, and turmeric is the T, RTQ. And these things are just do a, a great things to prevent and, re, and reduce your risk of cancer. Why, why don't people take them? Well, my doctor says it's genetic. Hey, I'm betting on immortalium. I'm betting on uh, Cocogevity. I'm betting on the 90. Join me and live. Okay, we'll be back with more truth, justice, and the longevity way on dead doctors don't lie for these messages. Okay, Doug, let's go to callers. Let's head to Texas. And Marilyn, you're on with Dr. Wallach. Well, Marilyn, you're on the air. Hi, Dr. Wallach. I wanted to follow up with a call I had about six months ago. My mother had a stroke. She was 84, and they had told her she wouldn't survive, and they told her she wouldn't talk, wouldn't stand up, and she has surpassed everybody's expectation, and it's because of the 60 tabs she takes. She took everything you told her to take, and she's doing really, really well. Super. Thank um, you so much for that uh, wonderful testimony. She, she's on the diet, and she behaves herself very, very well. Um, and I did have one question. Yes, ma'am. We know that if there's anybody that can answer to you, she was diagnosed with cataracts. And she tells me she's heard you talk about a non-surgical solution for cataracts, and she wants to do whatever it is that might help those. Okay, what does she weigh? She weighs 145 at this okay. point. Okay, okay. Well, cataracts are caused by free radical damage to the protein inside of the lenses. And it's not a switch-on, switch-off thing. It's not all or nothing. Cataracts start out, you know, a small little um, pre-radical damage in the center of the, of the lens and gradually get worse and worse over time. So two things have to happen. Stop the ongoing damage, no fried foods, no processed meats, no oils, and no gluten, no wheat, barley, rhino. She said your mom's been a good girl and done all, the, all those things, and so that's good. She just needs a... Cr- yeah, so she just needs to crank down and get even better at it, but that sounds like she's doing good. And make sure at 145 pounds, she needs a, a, at least three of our selenium twice a day. And I would also give her the immortalium. I'd have her take two of those twice a day. as one bottle of immortalium per month. month and um, I'd get her ORAC points or antioxidant points above 100,000 per day. That's what I do. And she could do a two pieces of triple treat chocolate. Uh, three times a day for a total of six a day. That'll get her up over 100,000. If she doesn't like chocolate or allergic to it, she can use our Cell Shield RTQ. She could take uh, five of those twice a day. That'll be six bottles a month. I think they're just little bottles of 60. So it's going to take uh, a couple of those bottles, to, I think five, to get uh, enough for her to take five of the Cell Shield RTQ capsules twice a day to get over 100,000 work points. And uh, that's kind of the direction I would go. Lots of antioxidants. Again, immortalium. Uh, wouldn't hurt to throw that in. Uh, two at her body weight, two tablets twice a day, one bottle a month. And then call us and let us know what her eye doctor says, because the eye doctor will be the first one to be able to say, you know, your cataract measured this, and now it's, it, I, I can't believe it, but it's getting better. And so in the earliest of stages, regardless of age of the person, cataracts can be reversed. But then you reach a point at which you can stop them from advancing, but you can't reverse them, and then they reach a point where you can't even stop them from advancing, and you will need surgery. Thank you for the wonderful, wonderful testimony. Thank you, Marilyn. We'll be back after these messages. Well, let's go to Michigan. And Joe, you're on with Dr. Wallach. Hello, Joe. You're on the air. Hi. I wanted to find out. I've got a friend of mine who has a grandson who has... Um, achondroplasia, short limb dwarfism, and um, he weighs probably 40 to 50 pounds. He's five years old. He does have um, bowed legs, and his arms are uh, locked in an 80, 90 degree position. Uh, I asked whether he had any other um, conditions, and the grandmother told me that occasionally he has uh, allergies, but usually when he's not at the farm, when he comes there, he doesn't have that. Um, he had uh, hydrocephalus and had a vertebrae removed in his neck when he was a baby uh, because of pressure on the brain stem. Uh, that's about all I have right on, on that situation. How can you possibly help him? Okay, so he was born with a, with a birth defect. Okay. Uh, the um, hydrocephalus, he had um, a vertebrae in his neck that was either enlarged or the canal through it was too small, but was putting pressure on the brain and the spinal cord. They surgically removed that, 
and he has achondroplasia. Now, did he have achondroplasia when he was born, and he was normal until he was two and developed it later? Do you know that scenario? Well, it developed uh, as he was a baby. He, he came out normal, I would guess, and then he developed that, and he also has the, uh, the enlarged head uh, that goes along with that. I forgot what the name is of the, the condition. Uh, the mother probably did not know she was pregnant for a couple of months, so she probably did not take the prenatal vitamins. Yeah. That might even have continued. There could have been a drug problem also, but that's kind of... Okay, well, here's the deal. Right um, you know, you almost have to read the pediatrician's <laughs> records to see what they felt. But when you have a baby born with hydrocephalus and they develop or are born with or develop later achondroplasia, that means their bones aren't developing right and they can be short, the joints don't form properly and all this kind of stuff. And um, let me ask you two more questions here before I suggest something. Um, does the child have any history of any skin problems, any eczema, dermatitis, psoriasis, or rosacea? She said no. Okay, good. So you've asked those questions. Any respiratory stuff, any chronic bronchitis or asthma? Nope. Okay, good. Any belly problems, constipation, Nothing. diarrhea? Nothing. She just mentioned the, the asthma, and that's it, or the, the allergic reactions. Okay, did you say the baby had asthma or, or allergies? Uh, allergies. Okay, not asthma. Not asthma, but asthma. Okay. All right. Do um, you know what the baby's allergic to? Uh, I don't know. It could be it could be like a hay fever type thing, but I, he lives towards the city, and uh, when he comes out to the farm in the country, he seems not to be reacting to whatever it is he's allergic yeah. to. Okay, so let's, let's be very, very... Um, well, we're going to have to run one of these message moments, so hang on. We'll be back after these messages. Hang on, Joe. Okay, Doug, let's go right back to Michigan and Joe. All right, uh, here's what I suggest, not knowing all the answers, but you did a good job. We've probably got 98% of all the information we need. But um, I would get this uh, baby on a, a really cleaned-up diet, even though it doesn't have any real symptoms of um, gluten intolerance that may not show up until later. And so let's put them on a gluten-free diet, no wheat, barley, rye, or oats, maximize absorption, absolutely no fried foods, absolutely no processed meats or nitrates, nitrites. That means absolutely no deli slices, sandwich meats, sausage, ham, bacon, bologna, salami, pastrami, pepperoni, jerky, and so on. Absolutely no uh, oils. That means no... Um, Olive oil, no coconut at all, no margins, mayonnaise, salt dressing, cooking oils. If he, if he eats canned fish, it's going to be packed in water, mustard, tomato sauce, not oil. And then lastly, no gluten, no wheat, barley, rye, and oats. Even though he doesn't have the classic symptoms yet, but he's only um, five years old, and so maybe a little early. Sometimes it doesn't show up until they're teenagers or even 20 years old. So I would just put him gluten-free just because. Anything to do with the brain, the heart, the liver, I put him on gluten-free. Then um, I would give him one healthy brain and heart pack per month. That's going to last him at 50 pounds. That'll last him two months. Give him a half a dose of each of the products at, um, um, each day, okay, a half a dose each day, and then give him a half of a half a dose, which is a quarter of a dose twice a day, of the healthy brain and heart pack. Again, that will last him two months at that dosage rate. I would also have him uh, get um, uh, the extra bottle of the OsteoFX Plus so he could take a separate dose of the osteo at um, uh, dinner time. I want him to have essentially a half ounce, which is a tablespoon of the osteo at breakfast and dinner. And then I want him also to have the um, de-stress capsules. I want him to have two of those twice a day. It's one bottle a month. I want him to have uh, six of the, of the um, uh, glucogel capsules a day, three at breakfast, three at dinner. Um, they're just medium-sized capsules. If you don't want to swallow them, just open them up, put the powder in a tablespoon of applesauce and give them to them that way. But you should have six glucogel a day uh, so we can make sure that we're magnifying his um, uh, maintenance repair and growth of cartilage, achondroplasia. That's talking about cartilage and joint underdevelopment. One last thing, I would get that spray bottle, and it tastes very good. Kids love it, a spray bottle of the vitamin D3. Give him one spray in his mouth per day, and uh, let's get him some vitamin D3 and maximize the absorption of calcium and placement of calcium, uh, magnesium, and so forth into the bones. 
Give us a call if you would, please. Uh, every couple of weeks, Joe, let us know how this child is doing and call any time. But don't wait longer than a couple of weeks. Okay, Doug, let's go to callers. Well, let's head to California. And Madrew, you're on with Dr. Wallach. Hello, Madrew, you're on the air. Hi, Dr. Wallach. I have a 54-year-old woman, about 210. She's um, had cervical cancer, and, and it's, now it's moved up. She had one surgery, and now it's moved up to the brain. Uh, she had that. Uh, she actually went to the um, had, saw a, a neuro a neurologist, and he said that um, she was told that they had removed 99% of it, but the neurologist told they had only removed 20% of it. Okay, so one told her they've removed 99%, and the other one told her she only had 20% removed. Right. Okay. Well, anytime you have metastases to the brain of uh, breast cancer, colon cancer, any pancreatic cancer, bone cancer, colon, you know, any of this kind of stuff, they're in stage four, very, very serious life-threatening situation. And, um, uh, you know, what we can promise is, is to help a uh, better quality of life. Sometimes we can extend life. Every once in a while there's a miracle when people live much longer than you expect. And so there's every reason to do these things. Um, I certainly would not have her take any more chemotherapy or radiation or stuff like that because at this point... Um, uh, her quality of life is the most important thing, okay? And so what I would do, what did you say she weighs 210? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I, I'd get her on a, a dietary change. You'd get rid of all the inflammatory things that drive the cancer. would be absolutely no fried foods, no processed meats, no nitrates, nitrites, no deli slices, no sandwich meats, sausage, ham, bacon, bologna, salami, pastrami. I'd get her off of all oils. It means no coconut oil, no olive oil, no margins, mayonnaise, oil dressing, cooking oils, no gluten, no wheat, brother, rye, and oats. Maximize absorption here in 210. I'd have her take two of those um, uh, healthy brain and heart packs per month, and that would allow her to have three selenium twice a day. I'd also have her take the immortalium. I'd have her take uh, two of those twice a day as one bottle a month. I'd also... I get her to take the Z radical. I'd have her take the Z radical mm, uh, three ounces a day. That's where I'd go with that. Three ounces a day. It has the, has the fucoidin in it. I'd have her take an ounce at breakfast, an ounce at dinner time, maybe an ounce at bedtime, or an ounce at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. However she wants to do it. And um, wouldn't hurt to th- to get her auric points above a hundred thousand per day. And you can do that. Uh, with uh, five cell shield RTQ twice a day or six of the triple treat chocolate a day, two at breakfast, two at lunch, two at dinner. I'd have her get the box of 100 count. Uh, it's a little cheaper that way as opposed to the boxes of 20s, too much packaging and so forth for somebody that needs that much of the chocolate uh, per day. Get the orc points over 100,000. And then uh, call me uh, every couple of weeks. Let me know how she's doing. Certainly you're welcome to call any time of Drew. But uh, don't wait longer than two weeks to give me an update. Okay, Doug, we got time to start another one? Yeah, let's head to Providence, Rhode Island, and Adelina, you're on with Dr. Wallach. Adelina, you're on the air. Hi, Dr. Wallach. Hi. Nice to hear from you. I have, I'm taking Centroid, and I also have cysts on my uterus, and um and I also have loss of memory. When I open the refrigerator, I don't even know. I had to think twice what I'm looking for. And I don't remember where I put stuff. And I'm only 50. Okay. Are you on any medication? Yeah, um, I'm taking um, uh, Centroid, but the Centroid is not from the drugstore because it used to make me swole up and... Very, very itchy, itching my eyes and stuff. So I've been watching Dr. Um, the Christian show, Benny Hinn, and this is where I found you. And I also found another doctor where I had to travel from Providence to New York. And I'm on a lot of um, multivitamin, which is I'm taking omega-3, vitamin D, all kinds of uh, ultra enzyme. I'm taking a lot of medication, but okay, well, I... Yeah, well, really what I'm asking, um, are you taking any medication like 
cholesterol-lowering drugs or heart medication or high blood pressure medication or diabetes medication? No, I'm not taking it, none of that. I'm only taking the Synthroid. Okay, so Synthroid is the only prescription medication you're taking? Yes. Okay. All right, and how much do you weigh, Adeluna? Huh? How much? My weight is 135, 31. And you're 31? 131 pounds. Uh, age is 50. Yeah, okay. All right. Well, again, I want you to clean up your diet, get rid of all the bad stuff. I want you to, um, and particularly with a low thyroid, I want you to also get rid of cruciferous vegetables. No cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, or kale. And get your pen and paper ready. We'll come back and we'll talk to you about what to take um, for the other issues. We'll be back after these messages. back with Dead Doctors Don't Lie on the CBS Radio Network. Dr. Joel Wallach here for Young Duty, 90 Flat Crusade. And Douglas, go right back to Rhode Island and Anna Luna. Um, yeah, in addition to the dietary restrictions we've talked about, uh, 135 pounds, memory problems, uh, again, having a thyroid problem, I would um, get on uh, one healthy brain and heart pack per month, take a half a dose for everything at breakfast, a half a dose for everything at dinner time. I would also get the ultimate uh, daily tablets. In case there's vascular dementia there, you've got plugged arteries in the brain as a possibility, I'd go ahead and take three of those ultimate daily tablets twice a day. That's one bottle a month. They're designed to support and promote healthy blood flow through obstructed arteries and support and promote healthy blood pressure. I would also take uh, three of the de-stress capsules twice a day, three at breakfast, three at dinner. That's capital D, like David, dash stress. And they actually have uh, a, a significant amount of the nutrients necessary to support optimal and healthy metabolism of the brain so it functions properly. And then I would throw in the uh, Smart FX. I'd take three Smart FX twice a day. That would be um, two bottles a month. And the Smart FX are soft gel capsules that contain DHAs and EPAs, which are the raw materials for your brain cells, your neurons, if you will, uh, to manufacture the neurotransmitters. Um, for memory and cognition problem solving. Uh, for the uh, thyroid, I would throw in Ocean's Gold, take three of those twice a day. That'll be two bottles a month. Call us every couple of weeks. Um, let us know how your memory is doing. Let us know how your sleep is going and so forth, uh, how your act, uh, activity is. You say you had a cyst on your uterus. Uh, that may have been something you were born with. That's possible. If the doctor wasn't too excited about it, uh, you might want to just take the... Um, we call woman's FX. You could take one or two ounces a day, and it comes in quarts. It'd be one to two quarts a month. And it's a legendary 150-year-old herbal formula and uh, deals with um, these sorts of things. Okay, give us a call every couple of weeks. You're welcome to call any time, Adeluna. Give us a progress report. Okay, Doug, we only have a moment or two, and so I'm going to share this moment with Char. And uh, Char is jumping up and down here like a feisty little boxer. Because we've, we've talked about this so much. Over the years, we've seen so many abuses of patients by doctors who are uh, gorked out on drugs or alcohol. And uh, she has some favorite stories. They're just really tragedies. But these are ones that really have gotten under her skin. So hang on a second. Oh, the number one story is the young lady in Orlando, Florida, that went in to have her baby. They put her to sleep, which is a big wake-up call right there. When she woke up, they had cut both of her arms off around the elbow, one below and one above, and both of her legs off at the groin. And when she said, why did you do that, they said, you'll have to sue us to find out. Here's, there's, Doc's got pictures of her on the floor with her baby that she can't even pick up. And there's no amount of money that the insurance company can give a family to compensate for that lifestyle that she's going to have for the rest of her life. And six months later, the doctor didn't even get a... Uh, a, a ticket or anything for it. Six months later, a woman goes into the same hospital with high blood pressure, young lady in her 30s, and they cut her arms and legs off. So what are they doing, harvesting arms and legs or what? I mean, it's, it's disgusting. And then I hear on the news that uh, they're saying they're giving drug tests to these poor welfare people, and, and there's such a minuscule amount of them on welfare. My God, how much drugs can they afford to buy on welfare? that it's costing way, way more money than they're saving because there's only about 1% or 2% that were on drugs. The doctors or the politicians that suggested that were probably on drugs for, for suggesting it. My God, it's, it's 
It's atrocious. They should be tested, not us. Well, thank you, Char. Absolutely. And Char's hit the nail on the head. Doctors, pharmacists, nurses, nurse practitioners, anybody that has any connection with patients, uh, people who are in nursing homes, hospices, all need to be drug tested. Um, and they can do it with urine test strips. Uh, they do this with athletes. Uh, we don't expect them to have a blood test six times a day. They can certainly get a urine test six times a day, especially if they're surgeons and they're pharmacists who are writing all these prescriptions and fulfilling prescriptions. Something has to be done here. Um, pharmacists and doctors and nurses are killing more people than an enemy. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Doug and Susan. Superlative job as usual. God bless each and every one of you. God bless our troops. God bless our Navy SEALs. And God bless America. America.